Hello, everyone. Um, this is the State of Student Voting Rights Conversation. My name is Valencia Richardson. I am a recent graduate of Georgetown Law and a um, board member of the Andrew Goodman Foundation. I was like many of you are today. I got started um, as a student ambassador for the Andrew Goodman Foundation, where I led some advocacy work at um, Louisiana State University while I was an undergrad. And now I'm here to, for, with you today um, and with Yael to talk to you about the state of student voting rights and what you should know as you're doing advocacy on your own campuses. And Yael. Valencia, I'm so happy to join you, um, not only as a former student ambassador who did so much work in Louisiana, um, but as a recent gra uh, graduate of Georgetown Law School. Congratulations, Valencia. <laughs> and Let's get started. And, um, I'm Chief Counsel. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll <laughs> so, go. Yeah. So I'm Chief Counsel for Voting Rights with the Andrew Goodman Foundation. Um, my background also is as a student and community organizer, um, and I work in advocacy and litigation. Um, I'm also a scholar of the 26th Amendment, which is the amendment that lowered the voting age to 18 and outlawed age discrimination in accessing the ballot. And it's just a pleasure to be a part of the Andrew Goodman Foundation family um, and to be developing this work and talking with folks across the country and sharing, sharing our work, broadcasting it out and trying to build power through this um, Take Your Power Back weekend. Excellent, thank you, Yael. Um, I think we, should, we wanted to get started by discussing some of the work that um, around voter ID. Um, and then we're gonna start um, on some other issues as well. Um, but first with voter ID, I'll, um, I'd like you to take a second to uh, talk about what happened in Wisconsin. And sure. Can, yeah. sure, so there's a, there's a few points of um, layers where student voting rights are infringed. And one is student, when we're examining the laws with regard to voter identification. Uh, we brought a lawsuit in Wisconsin, which is the strictest form of student voter identification in the country. Um, just one of the myriad of problems with the lawsuit, with the with the law itself, is that um, the student IDs would only be valid for purposes of voter identification if they were two years old. And students attend college for four years, um, graduate students for longer. And so this two year restriction really poses a significant impact, also an administrative burden on the colleges um, to continue to reissue these IDs for their students for no purpose other than the voter ID requirement. Um, and also in Wisconsin, there was an additional requirement uh, with regard to needing to provide additional proof of enrollment, documentary proof of enrollment, in order to accompany that student voter identification. That was recently overturned by the Seventh Circuit. Mm -hmm. But we still have this myriad of problems um, in Wisconsin. But it's only, I offer it um, kind of to help to tell the story about this issue of student voter ID more generally, right? We have seven states in the country that don't even allow the showing of any form of student identification to serve as voter ID. Those are Arizona, Iowa, um, North Dakota, Ohio, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. Um, in Texas, you can show a handgun license in order to vote, but not a student identification card, even one issued by a public institution. Um, and then in many other states, you can use, when you can use a public student identification card, um, there's a myriad of limitations on it, like in Wisconsin, um, or like in Louisiana, Valencia, where um, you did significant work around this issue too. Yeah, and so actually when you brought up Tennessee, I'm remembering I did some research just on broader student ID policies in the South, and Tennessee is one of those states that's extremely clear just um, in the statute that says we don't allow student IDs. Um, and I think it's a pretty blatant um, example of how they um, really do not consider student ID as a legitimate form of identification, even though most student IDs require a lot of levels of, of verifying your identity because you're enrolling by virtue of enrolling in school. Um, and so in Louisiana, we were doing some uh, 
work around student uh, IDs as voter ID because we noticed that um, student IDs, at least in the context of public universities, were met all of the requirements for voter ID in Louisiana with the exception of not having a signature. And so we worked um, when I was in college with the state legislature as well as the Louisiana Secretary of State at the time and LSU um, administration to push forth a bill that would require public universities to make their student IDs voter ID compliant, which was as simple as adding a signature um, some legislators insisted that we added um, an expiration date for my opinion doesn't really make make a difference because um, once you're out of school you don't use the ID anyways but in any case that wasn't a provision um, and we passed that law um, in 2016 <clears throat> excuse me with bipartisan support because we reminded the legislature that this issue isn't supposed to be at least, it's not supposed to be a partisan issue. I think there's this um, fight about whether students vote a certain way and if we encourage them to vote that um, we're going to increase the voting population, but I think we're not giving students enough agency in that respect and the fight for voter ID uh, reflects how, um, reflects the larger fight against voter suppression and trying to prevent the most marginalized people from voting. Um, speaking of, I think um, another big example of voter suppression at work in the current context is vote by mail. Um, vote by mail is a huge issue right now because we are facing a pandemic and where voting in person is not necessarily safe. Um, I think there are seven states right now where COVID is not considered an excuse to vote absentee. The other 43 um, have either have no excuse absentee voting or um, made adjustments in light of COVID. And so I'd like to talk uh, Yael, more about what you consider some of the main issues that students should look out for with respect to vote by mail. Yeah, so you, you mentioned this issue of um, of where COVID is not an excuse in order to vote by mail. Um, in seven states, you can vote by mail if you're over the age of 60 or 65, depending on the state, um, but you can't vote by mail if you're under that age. And COVID also does not serve as an excuse. And this is a real problem because especially in light of the pandemic, you know, you have young people that have compromised immune systems that live with people with compromised immune systems um, that might live with older people or, you know, generally sick people. Um, and so this issue of access to VBM, vote by mail, um, or some people call it vote at home, uh, really starts to kind of manifest and become clear. Why should somebody who's 60 be able to vote by mail, um, but somebody who's 55 is not able to vote by mail? Mm -hmm. Or somebody who's 20 uh, or 18, and this is the first election in which they can vote, but they have significant problems accessing polling places for one reason or another, um, not be able to. So especially in light of the pandemic, this, these are causing we already had issues with voting rights and election administration and access to the ballot and equitable access to the ballot and in many ways COVID is just providing a lens in which we see um, how these laws are just mis metastasized really yeah. and how their impact is even more acutely felt by young people, people of color, um, the, dis the, the um, disability rights community, right? Like all of these kind of vulnerable communities. But one of the things I love that you said, Valencia, is that these issues are nonpartisan and they're bipartisan, right? And especially when we're looking at youth voters, um, what one of the things I love about this area of law and this kind of constitutional question is that everyone ages, right? God willing, everyone ages. And so that impacts Republicans, it impacts Republicans' children, um, just as much as it impacts Democrats and their families. And so this is more about how we can all engage in democracy and access 
our voices within democracy. And we'll talk about it later, I know, but this is really the power of the 26th mm -hmm. Amendment, which lowered the voting age because it was so widely supported across super majority partisan lines, almost unanimously. Quickest amendment to be ratified in US history. It was President Nixon that signed it ceremoniously into law, right? And President Eisenhower that emphasized it within his State of the Union. And the reason for that is because access to the ballot is nonpartisan um, and it, it applies across the line. And so, you know, when you were talking about your story around Louisiana mm -hmm. and um, the fight for student voter identification in Louisiana, how that appealed to both sides of the aisle, that's absolutely right. That is what the history of the 26th Amendment shows. And that's why all of these accesses, um, these obstacles to youth voting that we're going to continue to talk about um, during this section um, are really kind of, everyone should be concerned about them and everyone should care about them regardless of partisanship. I think that's correct, especially when you think about voter suppression, it doesn't even, it doesn't, it no longer goes down to how you vote, but it's, um, it, becomes just it, what the essence of voter suppression is, is just a power struggle about who gets to vote. And that's why youth voting rights are so important because at the current moment specifically, we just ha we have a struggle about who gets to vote specifically with respect to young people. Um, and like you said, the restriction on vote by mail based on age is a great example of that. Um, I'd like to, as to, while you were talking, I was thinking, about a specific rumor. I was listening to the, uh, the news the other day that I'd like to dispel right now, which is the difference between mail-in ballots and absentee ballots. And, um, <laughs> clearing, <laughs> and clearing that up right now, because I think um, one of the more partisan points with vote by mail is that there's somehow some sort of security difference between absentee ballots and mail-in ballots. And um, when, there's functionally no difference between the two. And that's just something that uh, students should know. Um, but what other things with respect to, you know, rejection rates and current legal efforts do you think students should know as well, in addition to that? Yes. So I think that um, the idea, especially if you're a, a student organizer and you're mobilizing your peers to get out the ballot, to get out the vote, right? Or you're, we're talking about you specifically as a voter and and your family engaging in, VB, in vote by mail, like you organize your, your, your family basically to submit the ballots. Um, there was a study out of Florida in the 2018 election and it looked at the rejection rates across age cohorts in terms of vote by mail ballots. And it really had some striking results. 18 to 21 year olds had their vote by mail ballots rejected at a rate of five times higher mm -hmm. than those within the 45 to 64 uh, age group. And they also had their, the 18 to 21 cohort had their VBMs rejected at a rate of eight times higher than those 65 plus. So while we're talking about the myriad of ways in light of COVID and also independent of COVID of expanding access to the ballot and ensuring access to the ballot, um, including kind of safe and secure uh, and sufficient provision of in-person in polling places, uh, properly staffed and adequately resourced, et cetera, which we'll talk about later, um, or access to vote by mail um, free of age discrimination. We also have to examine and think about the fact that these VBMs are rejected at a higher rate, particularly for young people, um, and just, you know, leave that, like, just educate that, because it means that we have to be even more discerning about the ways in which we educate ourselves and we educate mm -hmm. our peers, how they fill out that ballot and what they should provide on it. Um, and these decisions, the other thing that was really interesting that came out of this 2018 Florida study um, was that these decisions are so um, varied on the local level. And that highlights even more the reasons why um, young people, particularly those that are students 
um, should foster relationships, hopefully that they could foster very positive relationships as they should with their local county registrar's yeah. offices, right? And in advance of, well in advance of the election um, to try to avoid any potential issues that might arise. Um, the Florida study showed drastic disparity in terms of even just the overall percentage of rejections of, of vote by mail ballots. Um, across the board for voters, not just for young people. So you're seeing kind of disproportionate rejection rates, highly disproportionate rejection rates around young people, um, also around people of color. They had uh, uh, high rejection rates compared to white voters, but also um, significant disparity on the local level, which I, extremely significant. Like the chart is like this wow. <laughs> in terms of the differences of, of rejection rates um, on by county by county. So that to me tells me that we really need to be working on the local level with our county administrators um, and particularly for the youth population. Yeah, and I'm thinking of like the types of um, rejection rate, like the, the reasons for rejection um, being something important to flag. I'm sure it's different across um, localities, but I'm thinking anything could be a reason for rejection if you don't have a witness um, properly sign, if you don't, uh, I've seen if people don't properly um, peel off the sticker on the envelope and don't properly close the envelope, that's a that could be a basis for rejection. And so I'm, um, understanding at the even at the local or state level, what are the um, primary causes for rejection? Um, why um, mm -hmm. New York State I know had um, released their data about why just the entire list of why like twenty percent of their ballots were rejected in the last election, and I know a big one was signature matching. Another big one was um, just not properly closing your your envelope and so things like that. Um, I would flag for every student to understand why also um, ballots are being rejected. The, um, you sort of started the conversation by saying um, the education piece, I think that's a huge education piece is understanding why so we can teach voters to like flag it for voters that these are the reasons why these ballots are being rejected. Um, what are right. some- and depending on and depending on the, and oh, de depending on the state, um, you might have an opportunity to cure any signature issues, right? Yeah. And so, you know, the striking thing to me about the rejection rates of, uh, or the rejections of vote by mail ballots and the rates of them, um, as well as the rejections of provisional ballots, right? When you show up, is that there's no real notification. Yeah. Um, there's no process that's put into place and we need to cure this. We need to cure this on the state level. We need to cure it on the local level and on the federal level. Why are people not being notified about the fact that, proactively notified about the fact that their ballots are not being counted, right? Because that will provide them the opportunity to truly cure this problem moving forward for future elections. Yeah. Um, but there's also that period of time, you know, depending on the state where you can cure your ballot, right? Like yeah. you can provide a signature match, you can, you know, you could do the extra step. Um, but you need to know that you can do that and you need to be notified. And so that's the power of the organizers to be able to um, know what that, what that cure period and cure process looks like in the immediate days, literally the immediate days following the election. Um, but for also, you know, we're talking to students, students and um, college administrators and faculty members, the higher ed institutions provide an awesome resource for study, right? We should be studying the rejection rates of our students uh, vote by mail and provisional ballots on the local level. This is yeah. a rich area of study of election science um, and our institutions of higher education are uniquely situated in order to provide that level of protection for their students. Yeah, I'm thinking actually back when um, years ago when I was a student and I organized around these, this issue and I had a ballot rejected because I didn't realize it got it was mailed too late but I didn't find that out until a week after the election and I checked because the Louisiana doesn't tell you your status until a week after the election and I checked to see if it was counted and it said rejected 
delivered too late. And I was like, <laughs> so my vote, I, there was, I mean, it was too late at that point. My vote wasn't counted and I organized around this issue. So how can we have to, <laughs> it's hard to expect other like lay people to know <laughs> that that is um, a problem without us educating them. If people, yeah, so. There's so, there's so many points of, of area in which we can grow in this, on the, on, in election administration it, it specifically. For example, I look to the gaps that we have in election modernization, right? Your example, Valencia, that you found out a week later, why is that? There was probably yeah. an election official that looked at your ballot within a 24 hour period of the election where you would have enough time to cure it before the election results would be finalized. Mm -hmm. And had you been able to know, right? Like we have incredible technology systems. You yeah. know, I'm not advocating for online voting. Online voting is not the answer. Uh, yeah. There's been a lot of problems with that. <laughs> and you know, I listen to the, to the, the hackers that tell me that's a really bad idea. Yeah, uh, skeptical <laughs> as well, putting our votes on the cloud, right? <laughs> yes, that's a terrible idea. But there are ways in which we can have safe and secure election modernization. Mm -hmm. And your specific example, right? If you were mm -hmm. able to access something online, you know, the night of election, the day after election, before the election period closed, right? Then we can have, and when that was inputted, that you automatically received a ping on your text message, right? Yeah. Hey, this happened to you, you know, Valencia Richardson, you can go and this is what you can do and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these yep. are like common sense strategies for modernization that are just, we're operating our election systems on a 19th century platform and we are in the 21st century and it is time to modernize them um, while we also push for other areas of reform and protection. Yeah. <clears throat> um, speaking of, I think uh, that's a good segue into another issue with um, voting to flag for our young people, which is voter registration, especially in light of COVID. So this is an area where the 26th Amendment or the, has been relatively clear that students can vote in their college home or their home home. Um, but that gets a little uh, murky when we're talking about COVID where a lot of students are not at their college home because they might be um, remote learning. And so where should students vote um, in light of COVID? The law, I think the 26th Amendment is pretty clear on it. The Supreme Court has actually ruled on where you, you're allowed to vote in your college home or your home home, but I think COVID's made it a little murkier and it could be a room for clarification so that we don't have students who feel uncomfortable registering in some places or, um, uh, are, let's say, for example, someone is registered um, in their college home, but they can't get to the polls because they're in their home home. So. Um, yeah, where where should we start that conversation? Where should students register to vote in light of COVID? Yeah, I mean, this is, so you're right. The 26th Amendment was very clear on this yeah. um, in terms of the case that the Supreme Court summarily affirmed and cases that went through the federal appeals courts and the state, the highest state uh, courts on the state level across the country, that students uniformly have the right to vote from their campus residences, right? And so this opens up a question, and I'm so happy that you flagged it, Valencia, about well, what happens in light of COVID? Um, you know, we're dealing with a unique class of voters. This is not going to happen. This question of which will foster significant voter confusion if the colleges and the organizers don't proactively work to address it now. Um, voter confusion is another form of voter suppression, right? Yes. So we have, we have to yes. work on that. Um, but there are some common sense solutions that the colleges can offer. And every college is taking a different approach with phasing students back onto campus, right? Some colleges, and this is changing day to day also, so there has to be some flexibility in this process. But we know that the students, the only reason they're not on, certain, a large segment of the students, the only reason that they're not on campus is because of this pandemic, right? That they choose to return, they intend to return 
back to their campus residences as soon as they're basically allowed to, right? Mm -hmm. And in law, we have this concept of an act of God, right? That there's something that's happening outside of your control that but for that happening, your situation would be fundamentally different. No other class of voters that I can think of um, is going to have this unique circumstance occur to them. So automatically this now or like in the future for that matter, like now or in the future will we see an event like this happen in a major election because we're in a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. It's this is very context oriented. Yeah. Um, and so but the, but the, what the colleges are doing, you know, some are allowing freshmen to come on campus. Some are saying only seniors will come on campus. Some are phasing students in um, uniformly, and it's just a question of when the students will return. Um, but my concern is what happens to the students that return to campus after the voter registration deadline, the advanced voter registration yeah. deadline, which generally is about 21 to 30 days, more or less, um, in most states. Uh, before the election, how are we going to give them the information they need in order to vote from campus? And why is this important? This is important because the colleges are, are considering these students to be residents mm -hmm. for purposes of the census. The census. Yeah. Right? And so mm -hmm. if the students are not allowed to vote from their campus address, but they're counted there as residents for the purpose of the census, we have some serious vote dilution issues that are that are arising. And if the, if the students are paying tuition dollars locally, right, then we have some like representation, taxation without representation issues that arise too. For a specific class and segment of students that an amendment was specifically ratified in recent history to protect. Yeah. Um, I'm also and thinking, so, Yael, just to add that, to add another problem, I think by the time uh, people watch this, there'll be about 95 days into the election. So we're also running really tightly, and then by the time school starts, really tightly into some voter registration deadlines and some absentee ballot request deadlines for yeah. those yeah. students. Yeah. yeah, and so, and I know we're going to do the know your rights part at the end of this segment, Valencia, mm -hmm. but just so that it's kind of condensed for this particular area of the discussion, yeah. there's, there's ways in which the universities and, and organizers, uh, faculty members that care about student rights, et cetera, can proactively work now. And the best thing is voter education, right? Um, providing an affirmative proof of residence that, you're call that for the students in the states that require it to accompany the voter re uh, registration. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, the colleges don't necessarily need to disrupt what they've always done, right? Like one option, and we've been talking to election administrators within the Andrew Goodman Foundation network to see what's happening on the local level and how are people um, strategizing around this. And one of the things that they offered is, look, why don't the colleges offer a uniform uh, education letter, right, that goes out to the students that says, you can vote from your, pr from your prior residence on campus. And mm -hmm. here's the proof that you can submit that this prior residence is appropriate. And then once the students start to phase in back to campus, perhaps they shift that specific dorm room number, yeah. um, but they'll still be able to vote, right? Because they do have an intent, an intent to return. Um, another best practice that's emerged is the provision of, um, and this is actually independent of COVID and it's actually a common sense remedy in many respects, is the provision of one physical address, like one university plaza that yeah. all of the students can use to register to vote from. And so then when they have their annual shifts from dorm to dorm, they can still provide that and they don't need to update their voter information. Um, so that's another positive thing that the students, that the colleges can offer in advance of the students physically facing back to college. Um, and I just want to flag something for the listeners, which is, you know, for individuals that um, might have multiple homes, I'm not talking about students, I'm talking about like older voters mm -hmm. that have multiple homes, they can choose where they want to vote from more or less i mean there's some there's some li limitations to it of course but this is an issue that is like uniquely impacted for students because they should be able to vote from their college domiciles mm -hmm. um if that is and and the other thing for students is that it is 
I, I often get the question, well, why, why should we support students voting from college, right? Like, why is that even an issue? The students need unique resources. They need to be represented on the local level um, in those college towns. Um, they are paying taxes. Mm -hmm. they, um, there might be housing issues locally. There might be, you know, various resources that, you, that students uniquely need. Um, and so, and of course, they're being counted there for the purposes of the census. Um, so those are the reasons why we should permit students and enable them to be able to, to vote locally, in addition to the fact that it's just a constitutional, right. <laughs> uh, you know, le legally upheld right. Yeah, and just like you, and just by principle, like you said, as long as they're there and living there and going to school there, they hold a stake in how policies are created in that area, in that locality. That's right, and the yeah. truth is, is that young people might not know where they're going to live after school, but that doesn't mean that they just abandon their right to vote, right? We have an right. increasingly mobile society. What mm -hmm. other voter are you interrogating in terms of, well, do you know where you're gonna live in four years? You know, we, yeah. don't, treat other, we don't treat older voters that way. We shouldn't treat younger voters that way. Um, and even on the low, and even on the individual level, um, if we're looking at the young people as a class, as a student class, for example, um, for example, I might no longer live on campus as a college student in five years, but somebody is going to step into my shoes. Mm -hmm. So as a class, there's always going to be a constant class of voters on that local level. Right. Uh, but we don't, but, you know, generally we don't interrogate um, older voters in the same ways that we interrogate the rights of younger voters to access the ballot, um, which itself is a violation of the 26th Amendment, even, even opening that question. Yeah. Um, so I think my takeaway is I think we need to, as we're in a point, I think a crucial point timing wise, where we can tackle voter confusion, specifically with respect to voter registration by implementing, which we'll talk about at the end, some like um, advocacy points that young people should focus on, but by implementing certain strategies to eliminate voter confusion, because even in light of COVID, students do, don't lose their 26th Amendment right to vote on their college campus just because we're in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd like to um, tackle our last issue that we wanted to work on, which is polling place accessibility. So um, again, this is another issue that's um, greatly affected by COVID. Um, I think I'm thinking of at least two or three reasons. Um, it's not as safe to vote in person anymore. Um, it's not as safe for the normal population of, voter, of voters who become poll workers to be poll workers anymore. So we're gonna have a, we, we saw this in Texas for the primary and we saw this in Georgia, I believe, for the primary and we're gonna see this in November um, unless we can tackle the issue now where we have a huge shortage of poll workers um, because yeah. the average age of the poll worker is in their 70s and that's just not a safe environment for a poll work, um, someone that is in their 70s to be in right now in light of the pandemic. Um, and then as well, um, going back to voter registration, eliminating that voter confusion um, so that students know if they, if they so choose to vote in person to um, where they're actually going to vote. We know that's compounded outside of the context of COVID by polling place cons con consolidation and closures all across the country. Um, in the last several years, there are fewer polling places. That's only going to be more problematic now that it's no longer safe to have large crowds. We saw that in Wisconsin, that disaster in Wisconsin where people were crowded in the um, people were crowded in the polling locations, and like it looked extremely unsafe. And I can't imagine that being better on election day without um, students thinking and young people thinking about some ways to mitigate that. Yeah, I mean, the, the experiences that we saw in Texas, Wisconsin, and Georgia should send the clarion call across the country <laughs> immediately um, that we need to remedy our polling place accessibility issues. Um, there's multiple ways in order to do that. One is expanding vote by mail so that less people are reliant on in-person voting. Um, 
but that is VBM, vote by mail is not a substitute for in-person voting, um, mainly because there are certain segments of the population that really need to vote in person, right? Yep. That they have issues reading or understanding for one reason or another, um, the vote by mail ballot. Um, and some people want to vote in person uh, and some people don't because of, you know, their unique situation in, right, in light of COVID and, you know, um, their, their immunosuppressed um, systems or the people around them. So the point is, is that yeah. we need to expand uh, polling places while we expand vote by mail. And again, this is where the colleges and the young people can really step in, right? And you said it, right? Poll, poll workers tend to be older. Um, we all know that from our unique experiences, mm -hmm. um, but the statistics and the studies show that too. There was a study by the Election Assistance Commission. It found that 56% um, of poll workers were over the age of 61. Um, and this is really remarkable. Nationally, for uh, only 5% of poll workers are between the ages of 18 to 24. Yeah. Um, and I, I see this as a huge opportunity for young people. I see it as a huge opportunity for colleges. Um, just like we talked before about how colleges are institutions of higher education um, that can uniquely study and train um, in, in the areas of election sciences to in meeting with their missions for civic education, right? Um, that we can really develop something that looks like a national youth poll worker core, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have AmeriCorps, but like a specific program for young people. We don't have to wait for federal uh, movement on that. We can do that on the local level. Uh, in Georgia, Georgia State University, our campus, admit, one of our student administrators within the Andrew Goodman Foundation, right? He brought a, a, po a polling place on campus at GSU, Georgia State University. And as far as we know, is the first polling place in the nation to be fully equipped by young people, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this is a common sense solution, um, especially the other thing that was interesting with the Election Assistance Commission study of poll workers, they found that 65% of jurisdictions reported difficulty in recruiting poll workers. Um, so this is the other area of potential growth that we can, that young people can really step into um, and that the colleges can work with young people to step into. And this is also related to, you know, in some ways the colleges in light of COVID, we should have polling places on, on college and university campuses. We should have it regardless. Um, and they should be fully staffed by poll workers, but by youth poll workers. But we did a survey of colleges within the Andrew Goodman. Fund. Sorry, I think you hear my baby in the background. Yeah, he's cute. Um, he's cute. <laughs> um, but um, we did a survey of the colleges within the Andrew Goodman Foundation Network. And what we found, I was very alarmed by this. Um, what we found was that 53% of the colleges surveyed reported that they do not have a polling place on campus um, mm -hmm. for election day. And then when we looked at elect, um, the availability of on-campus voting for the early voting period, right, um, in states which allow early voting, 60% of the colleges we surveyed did not provide a polling place on campus, even though they could have during the early voting period. Um, and just going back to the, the ways in which colleges can serve as a unique location for in-person voting in light of COVID. They can be staffed by young people. They tend to be much larger spaces. So the, you know, the six foot rule is much easier to meet, especially mm -hmm. when you're thinking about this bulky voting machine equipment and the optic scanner and you know, all of the election workers in the same place. Um, the, their size allows for like one point of entrance and one point of exit. Yep. If you put and it in like a large to, gym, you can, yeah. that makes a lot of space. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and they have large bathroom facilities, right? To facilitate mm -hmm. hand washing um, and also to prevent congestion in general. And they tend to have adequate parking too and beyond public transportation routes. Yeah. So there's a lot of obvious reasons why the colleges are uniquely situated um, to provide for on-campus voting, independent of COVID, right? But also particularly in light of it. 
And I'll just give you an example, right? And then um, you tell me where you want to go. I can yeah. give you two examples. Um, one is, you know, we're looking at the Andrew Goodman Foundation, for example. We have um, a Vote Everywhere campus on Bard College, which is in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. Not a place where you would think would be, you know, uh, subject to voter suppression, right? It's in. I think New a York lot State. of people are surprised to know that New York State is not the bastion for voter <laughs> voting rights that people assume it is. There, th and this is why I say this is a nonpartisan issue, yep. right? Like, what it. If, mm -hmm. if voting rights was fully partisan, and, and, and there's arguments to be said that it is, but there's a counter narrative to that too, right? Mm -hmm. Like if we want young people to vote and we want people to access the ballot, we need uniform election day registration, right? We need uniform automatic voter registration, uh, online voter registration, but you're not finding those uniformly, especially the election day registration, uh, in blue states, for example, mm -hmm. so there are, there are areas of improvement across the board because young people are independent voters, um, and this is about access to the ballot. And not everyone wants those independent voices to be a part of our democracy, even though they have the constitutional right to. And there's fundamental values of having young people participate in our democratic society in order to strengthen. The democratic society and that's the whole reason why the 26th amendment was ratified um but so so going back to this issue about polling place accessibility right bard college the students have to travel three miles um, from campus to go to the assigned polling location which is a small church um which is about 500 square feet i think it might be it's, it's more or less 500 square feet it barely accommodates all of the voting machines to begin with they have a history of lines going out the door it's not publicly accessible there's a tiny bathroom 80 percent or so of the voters that attend to go to vote at that polling location are coming from the campus right so there's a lot of common sense reasons and constitutional reasons under the 26th amendment and just general voting rights jurisprudence why yeah. the college should be the site for the community for an on-campus polling location. Um, or it might not be an or, it could be an and, right? That you can have two sites. Um, but particularly in light of COVID, you know, you think of these large multi-purpose rooms, the gyms, et cetera, um, it just makes sense. And in Florida, there was a state ban, right? On putting polling places on campus um, during the early voting period. And we sued um, a Vote Everywhere student ambassador within the AGF network, Megan Newsom, um, who I think has a different segment um, during the summit this weekend. Um, she like fl she she you know she shook the yeah. flag. She she pushed the alarm, and we ended up suing um, the state and winning on the 26th amendment. And once we overturned that ban, in just three months, 60,000 voters availed themselves of the ability to to vote on campus during the early voting period. And I expect that number to increase, quite frankly, um, because of the specifics of what was taking place there in terms of the number of colleges that provided it right after the um, court order was entered. Um, but, but, but I'm just hoping that that'll be better in a new election, since we're in a second round of elections since it happened, right? So it should, yeah. Yeah, and you know, yeah. that court order was entered in July 2018. The, the election was in November 2018. So, um, so I anticipate that many more colleges, um, first they'll look at the experiences of the other colleges, but then they also will have kind of more lead time to expand and mm -hmm. the organizers and the supporters for voting rights on campuses um, will also kind of start to, this is, this is the question of the relationship building on the local level, right? Because there yeah. you had a state ban, but it's on the local level that these, these decisions are made in terms of where they're going to situate the poll, the polling places specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, since we're talking about your rights, I think we we can wrap this up by just briefly, oh, yeah. um, having some takeaways for the students. So what, what rights should we leave people with at the end of this conversation? I think we pointed out a couple um, throughout the conversation, anticipating potential voter registration confusion um, on campus polling location, 
expanding student voter ID rights. Um, what are, what do we think, um, those are sort of advocacy priorities we would identify. Um, what, how should we round out this conversation about the rights that students should know about the current state of voting, uh, student voting? Yeah, I think there are, there are ways in which they can, for example, um, work with the universities to provide proactive notification um, to all students, along with a vote by mail um, application um, to their students and supportive documentary proof of residence um, and information around um, how students can register to vote from their campus address, even if they're stud studying virtually for a temporary period. So yep. one is working with the administration um, to do these kind of affirmative steps. Um, and that can also mean, by the way, putting drop boxes on campus um, to collect vote by mail ballots. Um, and in states that require notaries or witness signatures, that the colleges provide that as a free service. Um, Alabama and is a, one that we are in, AGF is in, that we, that's like in the news right now because of their notary requirement. Uh huh. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, which is a serious obstacle. I mean, young yeah. people don't have, they don't have, um, postage stamps, right? They don't have printers at home. So these are common, kind of common sense areas in which the colleges can help close the gap. Um, you know, students pay an extremely high amount in their tuition dollars. Um, having the colleges support their civic education missions by removing obstacles and making it as accessible and clear as possible for young people to access the ballot, um, that just, it just makes sense. Um, and it is really what their role are. So, so this is kind of a call to action for the young people, for the college faculty members and administrators to work together to see how these systems can be institutionalized um, immediately ahead of the election to prevent um, voter confusion. Um, and also to just to encourage people to come out to vote, just turn out itself. Um, you know, the ballots might be rejected at disproportionate rates, but a lot of people don't go because they also just don't know how to. Um, so a lot of this is just about voter education. Um, and so um, the same thing that I, I, I listed with regard to access to vote by mail, the drop boxes, the postages, the notification, um, a helpline would be great to set up. Um, and also increased advocacy. Now in light of COVID, things are shifting so much there might still be room on the local level for young people to advocate to bring a polling place on campus. Um, so that's another clear point of um, work that they can, they can start to move on uh, immediately. And overall, the support for expansion for student voter identification cards um, and, up, you know, and that's kind of a long-term issue. Yeah. And I think also on the long-term is, um, like we said earlier, is um, supporting kind of election studies locally, that the colleges would look and study why provisions are rejected, why vote by mail ballots are rejected, and what works, right? What works with regard to youth access um, in general. Um, and then of course, there's this point, which we kind of mentioned, but um, in this section, but the prevention of voter confusion with regard to the students' right to register to vote from their mm -hmm. campuses. You know, that's going to be a real issue. Um, but colleges are really already starting to do the right thing with their county administrators. So we have to look at those best practices um, and just inform our network that they're available and that they should start to advocate around that um, on their own colleges and in their localities. And just um, to sort of um, go back to the 26th Amendment, um, I think making sure students have the confidence that they have this constitutional right to vote. Um, by their uh, by the 26th amendment um i think you call it the forgotten amendment yael but the um butcher's thing sort of this whole conversation is how scary it is to advocate um for your rights and how scary the idea of you know challenging state actors is but you have this right there's a constitutional right under not only the first 14th 15th amendments but the 26th amendment which was specifically written for young people um, with young people in mind. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, you know, um, young people mobilized across the country. They mobilized throughout the nation's second reconstruction, which is like roughly 1954 following Brown v. Board of Ed, um, until through, through the ratification of the 
26th Amendment in 1971, young people have always been a part of the story of America to help shape our democracy. You know, you look at the ages of Frederick Douglass, you look at the ages of Alexander Hamilton or Alice Paul. We have always young John people. Lewis and I, God rest his soul. John Lewis, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, John Lewis, <laughs> it was his in his youth that he organized around this. And so I think that young people are often, you know, maybe they're disenchanted or other people tell them, well, what can you really get done? But we have all of these incredible youth leaders historically in America that have shaped our right to vote and have shaped our democracy, right? If it was not for Alice Paul's efforts and so efforts, efforts of the suffragettes, we have, which were by the way, on the centennial of, right? Mm -hmm. Women would not have the right to vote, right? And we we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the 26th amendment. And you know, what do we see? People don't remember what this amendment is, yeah. right? And so this is an opportunity for us to lift up what the amendment is, um, and to start to look at all of these obstacles in terms of access to the ballot um, from a uniquely youth situated lens. This amendment allowed for the protection of a class of voters and outlawed age discrimination and accessing the ballot in general. Um, and so there's just a lot of promise there. Um, my legal scholarship is called the unfulfilled promise of the 26th amendment, because you're right, it is a forgotten amendment. and you know, we need to, we're, we are on the cusp of a extremely important and critical election. You know, we have so many issues that are on the ballot. The rule of law is on the ballot. Human dignity is on the ballot. But when we look down the ballot, right, not just presidential race or, you know, Senate or House rep, but we look down the ballot and we're having kind of a cry out right now around criminal justice reform, around immigrant rights, around gun control, around climate control, right? Climate justice. Um, these are these are questions that down ballot races are also so critically important for the freeholders, the sheriffs, et cetera. Um, and so young people need to access the ballot. They serve a unique value in our democratic republic with their voices. Um, President Nixon, when he signed this amendment into law, President Nixon, this, I love to give this example because it, it shows how this is cross-partisan, right? He said that young people have the courage, um, the, the, the decency, uh, and what did he say? The, the high, I think it was the high moral courage to uphold the rights um, of our dem democratic society because a, na a nation ebbs and flows in terms of its idealism, right? And so I think that we just, this is such an important year for us to remember that. Mm -hmm. um, even in light of the pandemic, maybe particularly in light of the pandemic, um, and as we are approach the 50th anniversary of the amendment, this is the last academic cycle before we hit the 50th anniversary, which is next July, um, 2021. I think that's a great way to end the conversation, Yael. Thank you so much for uh, joining me in the conversation. This was fun. Valencia, thank you so much. You're such an inspiration. Um, you know, I love to tell your story about how you fought for expansion of the student vote um, <laughs> in Louisiana. It's such a great example for people to know about across the country. Um, and I just wish you so much luck as you continue what I know will be um, a very successful legal career um, in civil rights and democracy law and in voting rights. So um, thank you for all the work that you do, including as a board member um, of the Andrew Goodman Foundation. Thank you, Yael. You give me footsteps to follow. <laughs>